So the title of my sermon this evening is The Individual Responsibility to Serve God. The individual responsibility that it's, it's up to us individually to make sure that our walk with God is appropriate, is right. At the end of the day, you have nobody else to blame but yourself for your own shortcomings, for your own walk with God, however close or however far away you're going to be. At the end of the day, the bottom line is it comes back to you. God, this, this concept of you being responsible for your own actions is found all throughout Scripture. And we're going to see a lot of examples of this. But even going all the way back to, you know, like Deuteronomy, you go back to the law, Deuteronomy 24, 16, the Bible says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. The choices that you make are your own to make. Think about it. God gave us a will. This is why we're not Calvinist. Because God gave us a will. A will is a mind of our own to choose. As I mentioned this morning, you know, a will is what you want to do. Your own desire, the things that you choose to do. We are not pre-programmed robots. We are not just put on this earth and just everything that we do, well, that's just the will of the Lord. And everything you do is, is well, that's the way that God wanted you to do it. No, it's not. No, it's not, because God's not willing that any should perish, yet there are many people that are going to perish. There are many people that go to hell. Right. It's not that God wants them to. God wants that everybody would come to him in faith, but he doesn't force it. And we have decisions to make all throughout our lives. And kids, I want you to listen up too, because you have right now, you may be being forced to come to church because your parent decided that you need to be here and it's very important for you to be here. And that's the right thing to do for parents to have their kids come to church, hear the word of God, listen and, and get instruction. But there's going to come a point when you get older where it's going to be your choice if you want to go to church or not. And, and, you know, adults, we all have that choice. Every day you have a choice to do whatever you want to do. And you can, you can do what you want to do. But what we're going to look at today is that God's going to hold you responsible for the choices that you make. And we can't blame another person for something that you choose to do. There may be situations that you get put in where you don't have a choice because there's things being done to you or whatever. But we're talking about actions that you take good or bad, and the result and the consequence of those, and it, it's all going to come back to you. So we saw in the law that the children or the fathers, they're going to be judged or punished based on their own sin, what they do. The things that they do themselves, then they reap what they sow. Going back to that free will, I, I, I didn't have this in my notes, but as we're reading through the whole passage, one of the reasons why I love reading through the whole passage Look at the last two verses of Matthew chapter 12. The Bible says, and he stretched forth his hand. This is Jesus Christ. He stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, behold, my mother and my brethren. What a great statement. Imagine being in that crowd by Jesus, listening to him preach and everything else and just saying, behold, my mother and my brethren. He's calling you family. And look at what he says in verse 50. For whosoever, that's anybody, whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same as my brother and sister, and mother. But see, it's your choice. He said, it's open. Whosoever shall do this, whosoever is going to do the will of my Father in heaven, I consider you my family. But the choice is yours. It's not anyone else's. You have that choice. Kids, you have that choice individually. Adults, you have that choice. You may be forced to be here today, but it's your choice to listen. It's your choice to hear what God's word says. It's your choice. Your parents can make you come to church, but they can't force you just to, to accept or hear or receive everything that's being taught. That choice is up to you. We can preach the gospel to you all day long. The choice is yours to get saved. Everybody has that choice individually. But with any choice that you make, there are consequences. Good or bad, there's consequences. 
Obviously, when it comes to your salvation, that's the eternal consequences. You can choose not to put your faith in Christ. But there's a consequence associated with that. If you choose not to put your faith in Christ, then you're going to spend an eternity in hell. And that's what the Bible says. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. We're, we're here to learn more about God and be able to teach others and to warn others about that judgment to come. But you can choose for yourself. Or you could choose that free gift, recognize that God loves you and he wants you to be with him in heaven and, and just accept that gift and be saved forever. It's another choice you can make. But the choice is yours. It's individual. You are responsible to make that choice for yourself. In Matthew 12 here where we started, uh, the, the verses I really wanted to point out here, verse number 35, this concept of being held accountable individually for what you do is found right here. Verse number 35, the Bible says, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak they shall give an account, there, an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Notice it says thy words. That's, that's singular, that's you, your own words. Not someone else's words, not your parents' words, not your siblings' words, your words. The words that come out of your own mouth. The words that come out of your mouth are the words that come out of your heart. And he says, that's what's going to justify you or that's what's going to condemn you. He's going to hold you responsible for your own words, the things that you say. Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. And as I was already stating earlier, you know, our, our salvation is a choice that only we can make for ourselves. And we're going to see an example of this in Luke 14. Look at verse number 18. There's a parable that Jesus gave. Luke 14, verse number 18, the Bible says, And they all with one consent... Well, let's, let's jump up a little bit earlier. Let's jump up to verse number 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. We, here we see consequences. Consequences for people's actions. Now, obviously what this, what this parable is referring to, it's referring to Jesus coming unto his own, coming unto the Jews. They're the ones that were called. They're the ones that were chosen. They're the ones that were bidden. They're the ones that he went to first. And, and you know, giving them the promise, giving them the covenant, come, you know, but they refused it. They made excuses. And he's using an example of, hey, he's making a great supper. He's making this great meal, this great feast, and inviting all these people. And then all the people invited all just, well, we've got a reason why they don't want to go. Oh, yeah, I've got this other business going. Oh, I've got to do this. Oh, I've got to do that. And they make the choice not to attend, not to go. And he says, okay, your spot's still going to be filled. Someone's going to come. But for those people that were bidden, he says, none of those people are going to taste of my supper. And the people that are called by God and, and refused and rejected the word of God, they're not going to eat at the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're not going to be there for that. But it's all based on their own choices. And people make all kinds of excuses. People make excuses why they don't want to believe the Bible. People make excuses why they don't want to believe in Jesus Christ. People make excuses. And see, that, that's the primary application of this. He's talking about Israel. But 
look at the, the passage he's talking about, you know, bringing people into his house. Because I think this, this passage is also applicable for just even coming to church. Now, it's, it's more of a secondary application. It doesn't hold up as strong because it, that wasn't the original intent of this. But I think we can see the same concept, though, and we see this, this, a similar thing happening. It's not going to cause you to lose your salvation or something or not go to heaven if you're not showing up to church, right? But there are other repercussions for people not going to church when you know that you're supposed to go. And that is something that no one can force you to do unless you're a child in your parents' home, then they can force you to go to church. But for any adults in this room, you have that choice for you to make to say, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to make this a priority. I'm not going to let anything come in the way of me getting into the house of God. And look, look at the reasons that people gave here. Oh, I, I bought a piece of, you know, I bought some property and I need to go just make sure it's good. A lot of people think that's a pretty reasonable reason to not go into the house of God. Or um, I bought five yoke of oxen. I need to go test them. I need to go prove them out, make sure they're good. You know, work. These are, these are work-related things. Another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. People say, well, yeah, of course. But people give all kinds of reasons like that. Why can't, why can't you come to church? Oh, I've got something else going on. And, and usually the excuses start getting more and more weak. These ones might, even today, would, might be considered by some people to be very valid reasons. Now, the choice is yours, but the repercussions are yours also. I want you to turn to, well, I got this later in my notes. Yeah, we'll get to that a little bit later because I don't want to screw up everything. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. See, what these people are doing when they make an excuse is they're, they're just coming up with any reason. They're, they're putting a blame off of themselves and just say, oh, I have these other obligations. Oh, I have this other stuff to do. That's why I can't serve God. And what, what, I, what I really want to drive home tonight is I don't want you to ever think that you have a reason or an excuse to not serve the Lord for yourself. To not be relying on anything or anyone so much that if anything gets shaken up or stirred up, that that's going to make you not serve God. I run into people all the time. I was actually having this discussion with somebody yesterday that we're trying to give the gospel to and trying, trying to talk to you about you know, church and, and, and salvation and things like that. And you probably run into this. If you go out soul winning for any length of time, you run into people who they have had a very, very bad experience at church. Right? Someone was maybe abused or molested or maybe something not quite as bad, but, but some very bad experience. And they go, I don't want to go to church anymore because why would I want to go to church? This is what happened to me there. So they associate this really bad thing that happened in a bad church, right? Something that is extremely wicked, but then they kind of apply that with a broad brush to just all churches in general. And then that becomes their excuse for not going, not serving God, not congregating together, not doing anything because they've had that one experience. And you know what? The choice, and I, try to, I always try to tell people, look, you can't judge every single church based on one or two experiences that you've had in other churches. You know, yeah, I understand there's a lot of hypocrisy in churches. Yeah, I understand there's a lot of people who look down their nose and, and you know, you're not maybe welcome in, in some churches. I know there's a lot of, a lot of things that are going wrong. I know that the, the Catholic church is just full of pedophiles. I get it. But they're wicked. It's a wicked church anyways. It's not that they're not preaching the truth of God's word. But that doesn't absolve you from your responsibility to serve God. Don't serve their false God. Don't bow down to their idols in their temple. They're false gods. But because you've been damaged or hurt by some false religions and false gods or, or bad churches, don't let that spoil your own service to the Lord and seeking out the truth and, and still trying to be right with God for yourself. You can't control what other people do. But you can control what you do. We've got to make sure, and, and we're, 
we're, did I have you turn to Ephesians 5? Because that's where I want you to be. If you're not there right now, get to Ephesians chapter 5. We can't play the blame game for your own failures, for your own shortcomings, and just blame it on everybody else. This, is ha this happens in churches too. Maybe there is a really strong church, a good church, a soul winning church, right? And a lot of work for the Lord being done. And people have a tendency to get too wrapped up in one preacher. And then maybe that, that preacher gets into sin, disappoints a lot of people for whatever reason. You know, maybe they die, maybe they leave, maybe they're caught in sin, you know, all these different reasons. But if you're just following a person, that can just totally destroy your faith or, or, or destroy what you're doing. But we shouldn't be like that. You should be solid in your own faith enough and responsible to God for yourself that you wouldn't even let something like that shake you. That we wouldn't let something like that get you out of serving the Lord. Because God will still hold you responsible. You say, God, but this person did this. This person, you know, this person was, was supposed to be my, my leader and teacher and he, and he did this or he left or he, you know, he died, he's gone now. What am I going to do? Well, God still expects you to keep serving him. God still expects you to do what you can do. Now, there are situations that are better than others. It's, it's way better to be in a good church surrounded by people who love the Lord and want to serve him. That's ideal, right? There's a lot of situations that are much better and make things easier to serve God. But at the end of the day, regardless of your situation, the responsibility is still you. It's easier for a person to get saved when both parents are saved and they're growing up in a household where they've already been saved before the child's born and they're, re, you know, they're, they're trying to teach them and instruct them from a very young age. But you know what? That person is not any, you know, they're responsible for their own salvation just as much as someone who grew up with heathen parents that didn't have all the opportunities, that wasn't exposed to, to the word of God nearly as much. God will still hold them responsible for their salvation and for receiving Christ. It's still their choice. One, one day they'll hear the gospel and it'll be their choice to, to receive it or not. Obviously, we want to give our children the best opportunity they can, and everybody the best opportunity that we can to get saved, but it's still, at the end of the day, going to boil down to themselves. You're in Ephesians chapter number five. Now, you think about the blame game. I just want to make one more point about that, is blaming other people. You see that happening in the Old Testament all the time with the children of Israel and Moses, and they were constantly just blaming Moses and blaming God. Oh, why did you bring us out here? You know, did you come us, bring us out here to kill you? The whole time just complaining, murmuring, and just blaming other people for their own predicament. They get into sin by not obeying God, and then they start reaping what they've sown, and then they're, they're complaining to Moses about it. Oh, we should kill Moses and Aaron because we're out here and we don't have any good food. And way too often, people that are backsliding, they're always going to find someone else to blame for why they're backsliding. All the time. It happens. Oh, well, I have to do this. You know, oh, I, do, I have to get this job that's going to get me out of church and just no soul winning, no going to church anymore. I have to do this. No, you don't. You can find another job. You have to decide what's important. Or whatever, fill in the blank, whatever the case may be. Whatever it is that's going to take your priority over serving the Lord. You made that decision. You made the decision to put that priority in, in place of the other. No one else did. It'd be like me. I can't blame my children for me having to support them, right? <laughs> like, oh, it's their fault. I got to feed them. They're always hungry. <laughs> Well, I'm the one that had them, right? <laughs> God blessed me with my children. I, I have to do that. It's not their fault that they're hungry. It's my responsibility, and, and I have to choose to follow up with that. And it's the same thing in marriage, right? With husbands and wives, you're responsible for your own role in the marriage. You can't force your spouse to be godly. You can't do it. Just as much as you can't force someone to get saved, you cannot force people 
to, to in their heart, choose to be godly and to do what they're supposed to do. And sometimes that could be a hard pill to swallow. But what we can do is choose for ourselves that I will be godly, that I will do things the way that the Bible says to do them, and I will not allow my spouse, whether they're godly or not, to, to be my excuse for not filling my role. That happens way too often. And we're going to read the roles in Ephesians chapter 5, very popular passage about husbands and wives. But you have the, the, the husbands that don't want to love their wives and, and they become bitter against them and say, oh, well, they're not godly. They don't listen to me. You know, I'm supposed to be in charge. Not to you. And they want to say all these things about what their wife's not doing to justify why they're not performing their role. Well, I can't, I, I'm, I know I'm supposed to be head of the household, I'm supposed to leave, but my wife's always taking charge of things. Well, no, you know what? You need to take charge of things. You need to fill your role. And you know what? That might cause some problems. But all you, you know, if, if they're the ones that are outside of God's will, they're the problem, not you. But when you allow the, the, the person outside of God's will to just dictate everything, and that impacts your walk with God and your ability to do what God has commanded for you to do, then that is your problem. And you have a choice to make with that. And vice versa, right? So the, the wife might be saying, I'm trying to be submissive. I'm trying to be godly. I'm trying to do you know, my role. But my husband's a jerk. My husband's you know, sitting on the couch and, and playing video games and you know, doesn't care and, you know, and doesn't love me and stuff. That doesn't change your role. Now, obviously, there are situations where, you know, your kids need to be taken care of. And, it, and this is really sad and unfortunate where, you know, the husband's commanding the wife to go off to work and to support the family. And, and that's just extreme wickedness. And that's where a lady can find herself in a bad situation because she's supposed to obey her husband. But she's also trying to... to, to you know, God's saying obey your husband and God's also saying to, to be a discreet chase keeper at home. That's a difficult situation. And um, obviously you're still, you have to do your best to, to obey your husband and, and fulfill all of God's law. But um, I digress. Let's get, let's get into Ephesians 5. Let's, let's read what the Bible says about wives and husbands' roles. And keep in mind that you are responsible for yourself and making sure that you're, well, and, and for whatever God has given you responsibility over. And that we need to choose how we are going to live and not allow the actions of others to change our walk with God. Maintain our responsibility to serving God. Verse number 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. We believe the word of God is literal and that what it says is what it means. And I know that that flies in the face of today's culture and today's society of wanting to turn men or women into men and men into women and saying that a woman isn't very valuable unless she is like a man. And that's nonsense. Because women are extremely valuable in God's eyes and in every Christian's eyes. But their role is not the role of a man. Men are valuable. Women are valuable. They have different jobs, different roles. Let's not make all of them into one unisex role. That's wickedness. Let's, let's glorify and magnify God's creation for what it is. Let's have men's roles and women's roles. This non-binary garbage makes me want to vomit. It's so perverted and disgusting and I'm sick of people not willing to stand up and call it what it is. People have got no spine, no backbone to just be like, you are perverted. You are wicked. You don't even have to have a debate with people like that because they just need to be rebuked as being perverted and wicked. 
I wouldn't even waste my time trying to argue such utter nonsense. It doesn't even deserve my breath. It's just wrong. And it's so plainly, visibly wrong to anybody with two brain cells inside of their head. Let alone so easily proven wrong from Scripture. But let's keep reading here. We saw, we saw here wives' roles. Look at verse number 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself forward. We saw the woman is commanded to, the wives are commanded to be subject unto their husbands in everything as much as the church is subject unto Christ. And here on the flip side, we see husbands need to be loving their wives just as much as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. That is a lot of obedience from the wife and that is a lot of love from the husband. Both things are commanded. Both things are individual responsibilities for the husband and the wife and the actions of one spouse should not affect the actions of the other when it comes to your walk with God. You are responsible for being the husband that the Bible says that you need to be and you ladies are responsible for being the wife that the Bible says that you need to be. And if you want to get through to a husband or to a spouse, you know, to a wife, to a husband or wife that is not maybe in God's role, then the more that you fill God's role, the better, the best chances you're going to have. Husband or wife. Because God made us naturally to fill these positions. And the more of a good leader the husband can be by loving their wife and running the household the wife naturally will be able to follow. Even, even with all of the brainwashing and, and all of this, this feminazism that's been being crammed down people's throats in our society, in our wicked society, innately, God, go back to Genesis with Adam and Eve. The Bible said, God said unto Eve, that thy desire shall be to thy husband, he shall rule over thee. God made women a certain way to be led by a strong man, by a strong leader. And when the man starts filling his role, the women will fall into her role. At, at least, at least I, I can't guarantee every single time, but it's going to be a lot easier to get your marriage right with God when you are in your place. You can't control what the other person does, so you might as well do to the best of your ability your role with God. So at the, at the very least, you could say, well, I'm being... I'm, I'm right with God. If he's not or if she's not, that's on them. And never sacrifice your walk with God or your relationship with God for anybody. People want to sacrifice what they're supposed to be doing for another person. And, I, and look, I am a firm believer in being and husbands and wives loving each other and, and, and it's holding that very, very, very high value on your marriage. Very high. But that comes second to God. Let's keep reading here with um, husbands. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church. Verse number 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. There's a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That last verse just sums up husbands and wives' roles. Be responsible for your walk with God. Be responsible for the way that he wants you to be in your marriage. We also need to be individually responsible for knowing our Bible. See, maybe I don't have a good church in my area or whatever, right? Well, you, you ought to consider moving then if you don't have a good church, if that's at all possible, I think it's possible for, for the vast majority of people. They want to come up with reasons why it's not possible. But let's say you're in a situation, well, God's still going to hold you responsible 
for your actions. Even if you don't have the best opportunities because you don't have a great church, the Bible still says what it says. It's still God's word. His commandments are still there. And we see many times in Scripture Jesus rebuking people when they ask him a question saying, have you not read? Have you not read? I have, I have a whole bunch of verses right here. I've got seven of them highlighted right here. I'll just read them for you. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 1. And I'll read through some of these for you. Matthew 12, 3. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was in hunger and they that were with him? And this is the Pharisees are trying to accuse him of breaking the Sabbath and everything else. And, oh, they're eating their, the corn with unwashed hands and everything else. And, and he's saying, well, have you not read? Why don't you know what the Bible says about this? You should know this. Haven't you read about this? He says in Matthew 12, 5, Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Haven't you read that already? You should know these things. And he answered in Matthew 19, 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Matthew 22, 31, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God? Saying, and he continues on, Mark 12, 10, and have you not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Mark 12, 26, and as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And in Luke 6, 3, and Jesus answering said unto them, have ye not read so much as this, what David did when himself wasn't hungry and they that which were with him? To Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he explains just being born again. Being born again. Probably the most simple concept in Scripture about being saved. And he goes to Nicodemus, and, and when Nicodemus goes, well, Lord, how can these things be so? He goes, art thou a master of Israel and, and you don't know these things? You're supposed to be a teacher. And you don't know the most simple concept of being born again. It's a rebuke. All of these are a rebuke from Jesus saying, you haven't read? Haven't you read? He's not giving them an excuse. He's saying, haven't you read? You have a responsibility to read your Bible because anytime that you are not right with God as a result of your own ignorance, basically what he's saying is, haven't you read? I already gave you the instructions. They're there for you. Haven't you read? Make sure that you read. Don't allow anyone else to, uh, you know, don't allow your busy life. Well, God, I've got all these kids and I've got to work and I've got this. I just don't have time to read. You know what he's going to say? Well, haven't you read? The words are right there. You need to prioritize. How important is God's word? How important is God's instruction to you? You're going to let everything else come in the way or are you going to read it for yourself? You're in Mark chapter 1. It's our responsibility individually to pray regardless of your circumstances. It's your, it's your responsibility to be the husband or wife you are. It's your responsibility to read the Bible. It's your responsibility to pray. Yours and yours alone. Your walk with God. Your choices Mark 1, verse number 29, we're going to start reading. The Bible says, And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. This is talking about Jesus Christ, our great example of what we should be. Jesus Christ leaves the synagogue in verse number 29, and we started reading, with his disciples. So he's already in the synagogue teaching and, and ministering to people. Leaves the synagogue, goes to Peter's house, heals Peter's mom, 
After that, a whole bunch of people gather in front of Peter's house. And it says here, the whole city, verse number 33 says, and all the city was gathered together at the door. So there's all these people that are sick. They've got devils. They're in need of healing. They come and Jesus ministers unto them. He just got done teaching in a synagogue, healing Peter's wife, or Peter's wife's mother, excuse me, his mo Peter's mother-in-law. And now he's healing all these other people. And, it, and that was in the evening. He's healing all these people. The whole city was gathered together. How much time do you think that took? I don't think that was probably a short period of time. And think about this too, the weariness that Jesus must have had. You know, anyone who goes out and preaches the gospel, you know the, the uh, weariness that you feel, not just from the walking, but from the spiritual work that you do. Anyone who's done this for any length of time knows that there is a weariness that comes with doing the work of the Lord. It wears you out. Imagine how Jesus must have felt just healing all these people. It's a work. Yes, I know he's God in the flesh, but he was also a man. And he's doing this work. And then on top of all of that, it says, in the morning, rising up a great while before day. It's hard enough to even get up at dawn. Jesus Christ works a full day into the evening, into the night, and a great while before day. You know how important prayer is to Jesus? He gets up while it's still dark out a great while and goes off by himself into a solitary pray place. No one even has to know that he's going to pray. He's doing it because he's, his walk with the Father is important to him. And he is making a point to do that. And he is holding himself individually responsible to do that. He's not making up an excuse going, God, I mean, you know how much work I just did yesterday. I'm tired. Can I just sleep in a little bit? Can I get some rest? He doesn't do that. He gets up anyways and gets on his knees and prays. He's our example. We need to be able to push ourselves to do what God wants us to do. And again, regardless of your circumstance, if anyone had a reason to be able to ask for just a little bit of a break, it would be Jesus, right? Look at everything that he did. We want breaks over the littlest things sometimes. Look, I know what it's like to be weary and tired. I do. And I know I am far from being like Jesus because I let myself get some extra rest and things like that. But he's our example and we need to keep remembering that when, especially when it comes to just not doing things all together. We're not going to measure up to Jesus, but he is the example we could look to and be like, you know what, he was able to do all of that. I know I'm not doing as much as him. I could at least make sure I'm making time to pray. I could at least make sure I'm making time to read my Bible. I could at least make sure I am making time in my week to, to help other people out by preaching the gospel to them. I could at least make sure I'm making the time to congregate together with other believers. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10. It's the next place we're going to turn to. Because God holds us responsible individually for our own actions, for our own choices, for our own priorities. Cannot blame anyone else. And God wants us attending church. And a lot of people don't want to attend church because they don't like it. It's not, it's not the best church in the world. It doesn't have all the same beliefs that you do. But here's what I would say. If you have an assembling of believers, so in order for there to be an assembling of believers, they've got to have the right gospel because they're believing the right thing and they're teaching from the Word of God. And they're doing any type of work for the Lord. I mean, I would say soul winning, but it, it, even if you're in an area that has no soul winning church, I would recommend moving, but you at least ought to be congregating or gathering together with other believers. It is important. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 23. 
The Bible says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, this verse is, is often quoted and rightfully so for showing people how important it is to go to church and that you know, we shouldn't be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but sometimes what's missed is the reason why. Why should we be assembling ourselves together? Why is it so important? Well, because we need to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We need to be there for each other as a church. You have struggles. Other people have struggles. Other people have difficulties. There is a lot of stress or pressure from the world for you to change, for you to not be godly, for you to not serve the Lord. But when you come together in church, you ought to be able to receive encouragement. And just as much as you need encouragement from other people, you need to be an encouragement to other people. You don't just come to church to sit down and receive. You should be going to church to give. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about giving of yourself, giving of your time, giving of your love and attention to other people in the church. Because that is important. That is why Hebrews 10 is saying not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together because you need to be able to provoke other people into love and good works. Other people need encouragement, and we need to have the mind of Christ. He didn't come to be ministered unto. He came to minister. You shouldn't be coming to church to be ministered unto. Oh, I need this. I need that. I need people helping me out. You should be coming here saying, what can I do to help other people out? I want to strengthen you. I want to help you. I want to help you be a better Christian. I want to help you be a better soul winner. I want to help you to be more godly. We need that from each other. But we all ought to have the mindset of saying, I'm going to go to church, not just for myself. I'm going to go to church to help somebody else out. I'm going to go to church to be an encouragement to somebody else. That is why I'm not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It is that important for other believers. And there ought to be a congregation, a meeting place of believers in every place across the world. And when you know of a place where people are congregating together, you go to be a blessing to them. They may not share all the same doctrines that you do. You may not even have a place that has a pastor running the church, but there are some godly men that are preaching. You have, you have whatever, you, the best thing you have to go to. Assemble together and be a blessing. Provoke one another unto love and to good works. Good works, because the point of the people coming together to church is to be sent out and go and do the works. But then we continue on here in Hebrews 10. We see, as I mentioned before, hey, we're all responsible for making these decisions for ourselves. And there are many people that choose not to go to church, to forsake the assembling. Well, if you make that choice, there are consequences for that also. And in this case, very serious consequences because he follows up, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. He knows there's people out there like that, that forsake the assembling, but exhorting one another and so much the more you see day approaching. Look at verse 26, for, so it, it's conjoining the previous verse. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He's saying there is, there is a very serious consequence for sinning willfully. You know that you're supposed to do this. You know you're not supposed to forsake the assembly of yourselves together, but you do it anyways. Let's keep reading. Verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So when you break Moses' commandments, according to that law, you say, you, you, you're put to death. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. And, hath, and look, this is talking about saved people. This isn't talking about reprobates. This isn't talking about people who, who were not saved because he says right here, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. He was saved. He was sanctified by the blood. An unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. 
And again, we're going to see more proof here. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. God judges his people. This isn't talking about going to hell. This is talking about having a fear of God when you just willfully choose to disobey God's commandments and say, I know I should be in church, but I'm not going. Right. You better watch out. You see how serious God's laws were when it came to breaking Moses' law and people being put to death. And he's saying, I've given you a free gift and you're going to tread Jesus Christ underfoot and count it like it's not a big deal. Your own salvation and just choose. No, I'm not going to go to church. Jesus Christ died for the church. He gave his, we saw that in Ephesians chapter 5. I didn't make a point of it, but it says, you know, that, that the husband is supposed to love their wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He gave his life for the church. And you're just saying, yeah, I'm not going to go to church. The Lord shall judge his people, verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But you know what? That's your choice. That's your responsibility. God will hold no one else responsible but you for choosing to assemble together or not. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It's the last place I'll have you turn. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We reap what we sow. We are responsible for our actions. We are responsible for serving the Lord. We are responsible for making sure that we are doing things the way that he instructs to do them at every level, regardless of what anyone else is doing around you, regardless of if the whole entire world is going one direction, but God's word says something different. We're responsible to God's word. Think about Elijah. Elijah is a perfect example of this. Now, he wasn't the only believer, but he thought that he was. Remember what? He's serving the Lord. He had that great showdown with all the prophets of Baal. He's like, I'm the only one left, God. Did he just quit? Did he use that as an excuse to not serve God? Nope. He sure didn't. He, he, he still proclaimed the word of the Lord. No matter what everyone else was doing, even if every other believer was really lame and just going with the flow and going along to get along and not wanting to stir up any trouble and their fear for their own safety or whatever their case may be, Elijah said, nope, I'm going to stand for the word of the Lord. Thank God for Elijah. Amen. And Elijah was blessed for that immensely. And woe unto those people that were not standing with Elijah. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And all the more important, see, where were they congregating together with Elijah and strengthening him and encouraging him? Look, Elijah had some points where he was pretty low, where he felt beat up and down. I don't think he would have felt that bad if he had other people encouraging him. If he was able to meet with some other people going, yeah, we're with you, Elijah. We're here. We're going to back you up. Oh, but people have all their excuses. I can't go and be an encouragement because I've got my own things going on. I've got to go plow a field. Sorry, Elijah. First Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse number four. We reap what we sow, but we also get rewards based on our own work. Individual responsibility. God holds you accountable and will bless you based on what you do individually. Verse number four, 1 Corinthians 3, the Bible reads, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. Look at this. And every man shall receive his own reward 
according to his own labor. The amount of work that you put in, God's going to reward you for that. You, individually. Not what your dad does, not what your brother does, not what your friend does, not what your pastor does, what you do. You could become a part of a church that's doing all kinds of great works for God. You're not going to get any rewards unless you're joining in and participating and doing work yourself. Laboring. Don't ride on the coattails of other people. The other point I want to make about this passage is how much Paul is downplaying the actual minister or person who's being the leader. Now, leadership is very important. Having a good, solid leader, having a pastor in a church, those, these are important things. God wants there to be good, strong leaders, people who, who are going to get the most done and, and, and rally the troops up, as it were, to do the most for God. It is very important. However, in this passage, what we see going on, he's saying, you know what? Who is Paul? Who, is Paul? who are we? We're, all we are is ministers by whom you believe. We're, we are just workers, Right? We're just serving the Lord. It shouldn't matter who the worker is that's leading. It really shouldn't matter. We're all ministers, right? We all should be working together. I'm not downplaying the position or role of leadership, but what I am doing is saying the one individual who it is, we shouldn't allow it to become like a cult of personality or just saying, oh, well, the, you know, I'm of Paul. Well, I'm of Cephas. I'm of, you know, he's saying, no. We're all serving Christ. That's, that's what we should be doing. So you may have your preference on the people that you like, the way that they preach or the way that they lead. Great. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but don't let it get to a point to where you're just elevating this person because when you do that, like I said earlier, you know, if something is to happen to that one person, what's going to happen to you? You ought to be able to go anywhere where you've got a minister doing the work that Apollos does, doing the work that Paul does, and be able to fit in just fine there and maintain your own responsibility to serving the Lord. You should be able to swap people out that are, that are all serving God, that are all ministers, that are all plowing and watering and doing these various things. You should be able to interchange any of them and be good and be okay and not have a problem because you are grounded and founded on Christ and not on some other man. You are, are, have that as your foundation. If you remember a number, you don't have to turn to me, remember in Numbers a story where... Um, Moses needed some help and God was going to pour out his spirit upon other men to help him to judge and to help him to prophesy and do these things. And um, there was two people that didn't show up of the people that Moses had chosen. And uh, they were prophesying then in the camp because God's spirit still came upon them. See, they were chosen by Moses and God said, okay, you know, they were all supposed to show up. Two guys didn't, but God still poured of his spirit upon them as well, even though they didn't show up. So uh, and I'm going to read from Numbers 11:27. 27. It says, And there ran a young man and told Moses, and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. So they're like telling on these guys, hey, they're preaching in the camp. Like these two guys, they didn't show up. They disrespected you or whatever, you know, like, but here they are prophesying. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, my Lord, Moses, forbid them. He's like, tell them to stop. They can't be doing that. But they're prophesying, they're prophesying the word of the Lord. They're prophesying, you know, rightly, because God poured out his spirit on them to prophesy. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? He said, It's not about me. They don't have to even have respect for me, but if they're going to serve the Lord and prophesy, then great. He says, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? He said, I wish that God had all of his people being prophets and prophesying and doing this work. Amen. We ought to want more people doing that and not get so stuck on one person that you say, oh, no, he can't, who is he? He can't be leading or doing anything for God. No, Moses, you're the only one that can be. No. He said, no, that's wrong. 
Let's get more Moseses. Let's get more people doing this work. work. It's way too much work for one person. <laughs> Moses is the one that wanted this to begin with. <laughs> Great, let's have more workers. Praise God that he, he poured out his spirit upon these two men. Whatever your situation you find yourself in, don't allow your circumstances or your situation to affect your own personal walk with God because you are responsible. God, at the end of the day, at the end of your life, when you're standing at the judgment seat of Christ, it's your works, no one else's, your works that are going to matter. Take it upon yourself. Make it incumbent upon yourself that you are diligent in your service to God and try your best to make sure that you're in the best church you can be. And you, all, you, you have as many benefits as you can to help you. They're all great. But that you never lose sight of, I can't allow anything to become an excuse to stop serving the Lord to stop congregating together, but that I will do what God wants me to do regardless. Whether, even if I'm the only person in the world that does it, that's the attitude that we need to have. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that you give us from your words, dear Lord. I pray that you will please just bless this church, bless everyone here tonight. God, help us to be strong and steadfast and unmovable and solid in our faith and that um, you would help us to, to be able to roll with the changes in our lives and be able to um, just maintain our service towards you and that we wouldn't allow ourselves to make up excuses for not serving you, dear Lord, but that we would just grit our teeth and, and roll up our sleeves and, and just do it and, and knowing that we're here for just a short time. We need to just endure and not faint and, and try to work unto the end. And the reward is going to be oh so worth it, dear Lord. We love you and we thank you for being so gracious unto us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.